and welcome to this episode of How to Be a Great GM. Well, as you can see, I'm sporting my new chainmail, courtesy of Jake Dane, who's a master weaver here in South Africa. And if you uh, happen to be South African and you also want your own set of chainmail, just in case you, you know, need to sally forth in our blazing hot African sun, you can find him on Facebook under Jake Dane. You can't miss him. He's the one wearing the chainmail. Anyway, Jake, thank you very much for putting this together. I absolutely adore it, even if it does weigh 18 pounds. Now, today's video was decided by you through our Twitter poll that we ran uh, over the last couple of days, uh, hashtag um, HowToGM, or um, whatever it is on the bottom of the screen, because I've gone blank, as I usually do. Social media goblin is busy screaming at me right now. Anyway, so we ran a poll and we said, right, what type of video would you like? And you said you wanted the top mistakes that we as game masters make. And well, I compiled a list of my 10 mistakes that I know I make and try to rectify on a regular basis, but generally end up falling into the same mistake again and again and again. Why is it because I'm thick? Well, perhaps, but because I think it's something that happens because of our natural enthusiasm and our uh, desire to get on with the story and to make that game happen. So without further ado, here are my top 10 mistakes that I feel that we all make and that we can all try and improve upon to make our games just that much better. Now, if you agree with me, well, of course, you know what to do. Hit that like button and then subscribe and share and do all of the things that you normally do. If you disagree with me, that's what the comments are for. List all of the things that you think are wrong, incorrect or left out. And let's start airing our dirty laundry on the mistakes that we frequently make. Now, number one. The first mistake that a lot of GMs make is turning the game into an adversarial one. This is a cooperative game. The players and you are all friends and you are collectively telling a story. Far too often though, I see GMs turning it into a my monsters killed the entire party because the party was stupid. Well, maybe, but you shouldn't be relishing the fact that as an adversary, you triumphed over your fellow players. Yes, there's a kick that you might get out of beating four or five or six other human beings in a game of imaginary combat, but it shouldn't be done. You are trying to collectively tell a story. You are working with the players, not against them. So avoid that mistake. Number two, rolling dice for dice sake. You want to sneak forward? Give me a stealth check. You've gone forward 10 feet. Give me another stealth check. Give me a perception check. Now give me another stealth check because something changed that was minor and small. Oh, you've got plus 50,000% in your skill pool. Well, give me a roll anyway because the task you're trying to do, like make toast, for example, says that it should have its check even though the most mundane of people could do it. So calling for dice rolls, calling for checks frequently and for no reason other than the fact that maybe there could be a minor chance of failure is a waste of time. If there is no conceivable penalty for the characters failing the check, if there is no probable outcome that will see some kind of disaster befall them if they fail, simply have them pass. Move on. You're telling a story here, not checking every footstep to see if they remembered left, right, left, right, not left, left, right. Three. Inside your head does not mean that anyone else can see it. Now, I know that sounds a bit confusing. We've got these great imaginations where we see these worlds and we imagine these sorcerers with chainmail on and cloaks that are bedecked with numbers and all those kinds of wonderful things. But if it doesn't come out of your noggin, your players are not going to know anything about it, are they? They're going to sit at the table wondering what you're staring at. So this is a mistake that we commonly make where we do not give enough description. We don't elaborate on what our PCs look like, what they smell like, how they walk, how they talk, how they move. Buildings, we don't talk about buildings. So if it's in your head, you need to get it out to the players. And if they still don't get what you're trying to say, you need to work on your descriptions. You need to work on giving a better clue as to what you are seeing so that they can see it too. Four, a DM who talks more than her players 
is a mistake. Never talk more than your players. There are four of them, or five of them, or six of them. If you are busy talking more than that number of people combined, there is a problem. Either you are a proper storyteller and reading out of a book, or you are simply enjoying the sound of your own voice and your own brilliance at making up this grand story that Tolkien and Martin are going to applaud you for. GMs, shut up. Listen to what your players are saying. React to what they're doing. Prompt them, feed them, paint a picture, but then let them explore the picture. Let them talk to the picture. That's a bottom line. And trust me, trust me, I will be telling the players tomorrow that if they don't talk to the GM, it is just as much of a mistake as you talking too much. So it is a give and a take. And yes, there are times where you need to describe a scene where you might be talking for a few minutes, but then your players should be talking for several dozen minutes as they engage with that space. Something to bear in mind. Now, completely contrary to what I've just said, is you mustn't overload your players. So yes, we must get what is out of our heads. We must get it out. We must use words, these things. What? Bleh. The chainmail is interfering with my ability to cast linguistics. You have to get out of your head what you are seeing to your players. At the same time, though, mistake number five is that GMs often overload. So you just pour so much information into the players' pool of understanding that they get lost. They get confused as to whether they should be following the red herring, or is it the green herring, or the blue herring with the shiny teeth, because you put emphasis on the color of the cat. Maybe the cat is related to the herring. Meanwhile, they have nothing to do with one another. So overloading is also a bad habit, and it's a bad mistake that we sometimes make. We need to strike that line where you can be succinct as well as descriptive. Six, you are responsible for coming up with the plot. Collectively, you and the players are responsible for the story. That means that you are in a cooperative environment that means that when you are creating this game, when you're creating this world, you need to ask whether your players want it or not. Forcing a horror situation onto them and you know they don't like horror, what are you doing? That's a mistake. So if you've established with your players that they enjoy comedy, well, don't force these ultra horrific scenes on them, especially if they've said that they don't like those kind of things. If they don't like politics, don't drag them into a political game. So don't try and force your story onto your players. You have to collectively create the story and you both have to enjoy it. Now, if your players don't like horror and you love horror, what do you do? You go and find another group who likes horror. That's what you do. You don't try and force horror onto your group. Seven not preparing. Now, yes, a lot of videos on this channel are about dungeons on the fly, stories on the fly, seeding on the fly, NPC dialogue on the fly. Everything is about on the fly, which would imply no preparation. That is not true. You must always prepare in some small way. You need to think, reflect, come up with some kind of plan for the session. Only once you've been DMing for decades can you possibly show up, the table, up to the table with nothing prepared and hope to have something that flows and that makes sense and that engages your players. So, not preparing is a major mistake. The GM who arrives going, oh, I, I didn't prepare anything. Oh, you know, I'll, I'll wing it. I'll wing it and it'll be perfect. Well, maybe it might be because you're a great GM. But generally speaking, if you're just winging it, you're going to fall short. It's a mistake. Don't do it. Number eight, not involving the characters. This is very similar to just telling your own story. It's very similar to you talking more than the players. However, this is a mistake that frequently gets made, especially by younger GMs who don't have proper table control. Now, what am I doing when I'm doing this? I'm going player one, player two, player three, player four, player five. I'm making sure that every single one of those players has been engaged. 
that I have got a story running for them, that I have got something that they can be involved in that is unique to them. I've gone into their backstory, I've gone into their personalities, and I'm starting to craft stories for each of them. If you have a player that you keep skipping out, that's a problem. And that is a mistake that we make. So table control is something that you have to learn. And it's both because of initiative or because of round order or because of order of action or whatever you want to call it, but it's also so that you know that you have engaged each and every single one of them, even if they're on a shopping spree. And this one is shopping specifically for something and that one is, and the rest are just following along. You still should try to engage each and every single one as you make your way through your narrative. Number nine, favoritism. Oh, now this comes into this. If you are just focusing on the one player because they do great voices or because they've got a great backstory or because they engage you whereas nobody else does, it's favoritism. And all that you're doing is you are engendering that character to continue their performance and you are disenfranchising the rest of your players because even when they try and give you a performance, you are favoritizing. You are showing favor to one of the players in particular. Don't do it. It's a mistake and it does happen, especially if you've got one player who's engaging you and feeding you and giving you everything that you're looking for and you're giving them and they're just rolling with, oh, and we've got such a great time. What about the rest? Don't ignore the rest of your players. This brings me to number 10. And number 10 is a mistake that we make consciously or unconsciously. It is when we punish players. That could be because they've irritated us in real life. They arrived late for the game without an excuse. They didn't bring your favorite cookies. Whatever the reason might be, or because in game, they figured out your sneaky little riddle. They solved the mystery way before you even started to get into it. They worked it out and so you're now left with nothing. So instead of moving forward and using all of the improvisational skills that we've been developing on this channel, you punish the players by throwing in some kind of random encounter that's way too tough to prove that you are still in control. Remember, it's not adversarial, it is cooperative. And when they outsmart you, and they will because there's more of them than there are of you, and as much as GMs like to think that we're the brains of the operation, we are but one soul. So do not I repeat, do not punish players for out-of-game actions or for in-game actions that have offended you. If they committed a crime in front of police officers, yes, punish them by all means. Hang them up. Take them to the gallows. Destroy them. But if they've just done it because of who they are and because you think that they've slighted you by outwitting you, it's a mistake. Well, those are my top 10 mistakes that I think GMs make frequently and that I have encountered in all of my role-playing experiences. Like I said, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button if you want to see more of these kind of videos. Join us on Twitter, GM Tips, or uh, how to GM, how GM. It's on the screen, it's on the screen. Go find us there, join us, have that conversation. You can find us on Facebook. I'm not even going to try and work out what that one is. Join us on Facebook. You can join us on Patreon, where we're starting to, well, not starting to, where we are giving out modules and characters and maps and all kinds of stuff for those of you that are supporting us on Patreon. You can go and watch the Windswift, the Adventures of the Windswift on the Bacon RPG channel, which is linked to this one, where you see me running a game and uh, my players and I do a breakdown at the end of each of those episodes. We are still getting into it as one does when you have multiple people from across the planet. We've got a German, we've got an Australian, we've got an American, we've got a Brit. We've just got people from all over the world playing. And what we do after every session is we do a breakdown of how that session worked. So uh, in terms of the GM, I give breakdown what worked for me, what didn't work for me, where did I get stuck, where did I try and fix something. And from the players' perspectives, they give us the same breakdown. So those are really useful. We're wrapping up the first major storyline that's been running through. So in the near future, hopefully, we'll be starting on season two or episode two or whatever you want to call it, where we start a brand new adventure. And uh, we'll have worked out all the technical stuff. Until then and until next time, I wish you and yours the very happiest of gaming.